All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Executive Virtual Forum, Ways to Drive Revenue in your recovery, re, with your recovery plans. Thank you all for taking out the time from your day to join us. My name is Marianne Warner. I am the Senior Marketing Manager over here at CCG, and I'll be kicking things off. Uh, just a couple housekeeping rules to start. Um, on the right-hand sidebar, you'll see that you have the ability to chat and ask questions. We definitely encourage folks to um, be engaged throughout the event. So if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in there. And I just ask if you could uh, include who you're directing the question to, so that way we could uh, direct it to the right person. We will also be featuring some polls throughout the event. Um, in case you do have an issue with selecting the correct answer or an, any kind of issues with the poll, I recommend just exiting full screen mode and you should be uh, just fine with answering the questions. We've also included a couple really great resources uh, to support the discussion topics today. In the handout section on your right-hand sidebar, you will see a couple items, including a recent blog post from Natalie Greenwood on governance in a virtual workforce, a customer story on how one brand leveraged uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing to streamline production, a, another recent blog post on essentials to a data assessment strategy, and a white paper on a streamlined approach for enterprise data governance. Feel free to save those uh, assets to reference after the event, or you can visit us at ccganalytics.com forward slash resources. This event, event is also being recorded. So if you do miss something, or maybe you have a colleague who couldn't attend today, um, we will be sharing the on-demand recording uh, when it is available. And without further ado, I will go ahead and uh, introduce our main moderator for today, Brian Rice. For those of you who haven't met Brian, uh, he is a dedicated and energetic data and analytics advocate with over 20 years of experience. Brian is one of the founders of CCG and currently serves as the chief customer officer, helping customers realize value from analytics transformation. Most recently, he was part of the team at CCG to develop ADAPT, standing for Analyze, Decide, Act, protect and triumph, which, was, which has empowered our community to continuously listen, learn, and adapt through this pandemic and economic crisis. Without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Brian, and thanks again for joining us today. Thanks so much, Marianne. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I'll take that as a yes. All right. Yeah, I would say uh, energetic is definitely a word that um, People normally uh, introduce me or describe me with. There's a lot of other choice words I won't uh, I won't add to that. But uh, thanks for that. And uh, just to let everyone know, we kind of opened with 10 minutes or so just to kind of chat a little bit. I got a few topics I'll cover for everyone. Everyone, but wanted to give some time for everybody to hopefully start to wrap up their business day and and tune in to our forum today and get ready for the weekend. So. Um, in about seven minutes or so, we'll get started with our, our first session. But we're really thrilled, um, both with you giving your time to attend today. Definitely appreciate that. And just generally the kind of response to this forum, um, as with many organizations, it's the first time that we've put together a virtual forum like this, um, a little different than a webinar. And, um, you know, we're just thrilled with the response. We've had a lot of, of customers and, and experts um, make the time to participate in the conversation, which has been awesome and kind of overwhelming, at least from kind of where, where we started this response of attendees. So definitely appreciate that. And um, and, and we're going to continue to do uh, a variety of things, but certainly more of these forums, um, both from the response and just kind of having the feeling that there's nothing like this out, out there in terms of having the specific context of data analytics um, and the type of interaction that we're looking to provide. So um, please do be on the lookout for more. Um, I, I want to thank those that already have, but also encourage um, anyone attending to please do give us your feedback. Um, when you're committing this kind of time, we're, we're looking to do everything we can to make it valuable for you. Um, so whether it's particular topics, formats of conversation, um, logistics about uh, the webinar itself, please do, um, you know, fill out the survey at the end, send us an email, shoot me a text, 
phone call, whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, but give us the feedback to let us know what we can um, continue to kind of enhance this um, to be for you. Um, as Marianne mentioned, uh, we started, uh, I guess, about six weeks ago now, our ADAPT program, uh, which was kind of our version of putting together as much information uh, that we could around what we are seeing our customers doing, what our experts um, are, are helping our customers do and kind of evaluating as we're always monitoring what's the right thing to do in the marketplace. Um, what they're doing to uh, adapt, obviously, <laughs> to this, this crisis. Um, so we, we launched our, our webpage, a newsletter, a variety of things. And this forum was kind of the culmination of the first wave of that. Um, just trying to help, right? To be here to serve our customers, serve our community and marketplace. Um, providing the expertise that, that we and our customers have to you and, and helping, helping you, uh, kind of tackle this, this challenge. Um, some of the themes that, uh, we've, we've got overarching both forums. Uh, we did, for those of you that don't know, we had, uh, kind of part one of this on Tuesday morning, uh, which was fantastic. And, uh, you should be able to access that recording if, um, if you weren't able to attend. Um, but between, between Tuesday morning and today, um, react, recover, reimagine. Uh, that's what CCG has kind of structured in terms of categorizing any individual company industry role, um, or even kind of individual functions with, within an organization as to where, where you are right now, um, and adapting to the crisis. And we're looking to do everything we can to quickly provide you the, the input, insights, and information, um, to be able to kind of progress along that uh, continuum. Um, today, we're, we're bringing that same theme. So a lot of the kind of discussions you'll, you'll hear will be oriented towards us. Um, but we're also trying to add in a bit of a focus to some of the things that we've heard from everyone, which is there's a lot of things we all need to do. There's a lot of things we know and don't know. Um, but no matter what, uh, we've got a, uh, every, every business, every organization, every person, team leader, has got to be very mindful of of their their cash and liquidity management, as well as um, tackling you know where where is revenue going to come from? Where are you going to replace revenue? Where are you going to start to to uh, grow it back to where it was kind of before all of this happened? Um, so we're excited uh, for all the topics we have today. It looks like Marion is displaying our agenda. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start uh, with a conversation, uh, kind of, kind of a little bit deep in the weeds, um, with the topic being AI and data science. Um, but Ray and Brian are going to um, talk a little bit about what they've been doing together um, with data science um, at, at Gordian. Then we're going to have, and, and, and the goal today was to kind of have a lot of different perspectives. Um, so then we're going to shift to one of the thought leaders from Microsoft uh, in the retail space and have a little bit of discussion about what he's seeing there and what they're doing to uh, react, recover, reimagine, as well as how how they're quickly deploying things to focus on that uh, cash management and, and starting to get revenue engine uh, running again. Uh, then Dan Rodriguez and Natalie Greenwood are going to spend a little time talking about data governance uh, from a variety of perspectives. And, and then we'll have a panel with uh, Jason Kurtz, Brian Beasley and John Joes, um, again, with kind of a, a, a few different angles on what they see as critical to um, getting in place for the entire organization to have the visibility they need to um, to that liquidity and revenue. Uh, and then Dan Rodriguez is going to jump in again and have a conversation with a, a really fantastic and inspirational guy, Chris Laping, um, about uh, change leadership in, in time of crisis. And then uh, hopefully everyone will stick around, and uh, when we wrap up, we'll take questions through the chat, maybe open up the microphone. Um, everybody can, if you hadn't already at that point, um, gra grab your preferred cocktail, uh, have happy hour, and have a little open Q&A and discussion. Um, and that can continue as long as, as folks would like it. And I'm definitely conscious of the fact that everyone is looking forward to getting to their weekend. Um, all right, so with that said, we're kind of right at time. Marianne, I didn't know if you wanted to launch one of the polls at this point, which you could kind of do on the side um, while we get 
uh, Brian and Ray started? Yeah, which one would you like to do? The first one? You choose, yes. Let's start with the first. <laughs> All right. All right, great. So to everyone on the call, um, you should hopefully see a poll there. Please, looks like people are already seen it, right? So just trying to collect a little bit of information um, from you. All right, so I keep us on time. Um, I will go ahead and get us started. Um, as I said, um, adaptive advanced analytics is, is kind of the topic. Um, I think we all um, hopefully know that Data science and AI had already been a, a big topic for a lot of organizations, um, but in, in, in certain uh, kind of aspects, it's even more critical now than ever. Um, so if Ray and Brian, you'd like to join the video feeds, which might be a Marianne thing. It's showing his pause right now. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Here's the uh, results from the poll that you just asked for. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I'll go back and uh, I'll circle back and check that out, but I definitely want to get Brian and Ray um, talking. I don't want to eat into too much of their time. So, um, Brian, uh, I, I think I'm going to ask you to start us off and I'll, I'll be transparent to, transparent to the audience here. Um, I'm fully aware um, that CCG and Gordian have been doing some really great things uh, around data science and AI. But I'll be frank, I'm not even sure the details of what you've been doing. Um, so I'd love to hand it off to you and see if uh, you and Ray can introduce yourselves and start to give us a little bit of that uh, that picture. Sure, yeah. So uh, I'll introduce myself, Brian Beasley, uh, Director of Data Science Consulting for CCG. So everything we do around predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, is within my group. Um, so my background is actually in financial services. Uh, so uh, before coming to CCG, I was um, working really in sort of the data space around regulations, um, quantitative applications within the financial services world. Wanted to really um, open up my scope and, and, uh, and um, focus on some of the more cutting edge things like machine learning, AI. And so I've been able to do that over the course of the last several years. And have been working with with Ray on some pretty exciting stuff. Um, so Ray, if you want to introduce yourself. Thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Ray Diwakar. I run the innovation group at Gordian. Our main our focus, at least my group's focus, has been always to look at the future, the next five, six years, or five, ten, ten years, into what kind of technologies that we can adopt uh, and bring new uh, products to the space, the construction space. So Brian saying that it was. Uh, some really interesting work. Uh, you have to actually take that into account that he is working with construction data, which is somewhat boring when you look at, uh, you know, like financial data or some other kind of uh, more exciting data sets. So uh, the one of the things that we do is we actually are in construction software space. We build uh, construction um, solutions as well as data for uh, for owners. Excellent. Well, so thanks for the intro. Um, Brian, maybe you could start to frame up what you guys have been doing to leverage data science and AI um, and start sharing some of that with the audience. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, Ray can obviously hop in at any point, but, um, you know, what, what we've been focused on is uh, the, the process called job order uh, contracting. Uh, which is where, um, you know, Gordian has, uh, has software that supports um, the relationship between kind of building contractors and owners of buildings. Um, and so anytime new construction work needs to be done, they go into the, the software and, um, and that's what's used to sort of manage the workflow of procuring that work. And so they'll, they'll uh, agree upon some sort of scope, which is usually written into the application as free form text. And then they go out to these massive uh, catalogs of uh, of construction tasks, um, 150,000 tasks in a catalog, and they pull those into a proposal. And what that does is it provides visibility, it provides some standardization around pricing, um, right? And so both sides benefit because con contractors have access to these owners of buildings, 
owners of buildings have access to contractors who are willing to sort of fix prices and um, have some control there. Uh, the challenge was around the fact that it was taking about uh, 30 days to get from like an RFP to a first cut at a proposal and then another 30 days to get those approved. And so we wanted to see if we could cut that down with some artificial intelligence. Um, and so what we've been doing is actually building a natural language processing engine um, to, uh, to streamline that process by saying, okay, let's take that free form text and let's actually um, have the robotic agent search through the catalogs and say, can we pull in like a first draft of that, uh, that proposal uh, just sort of in an automated fashion? Um, so Ray, so, I don't know if you want to add any color there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, the few things that you didn't touch on is the fact that when you look at the scope of a certain project, um, every user has a different language. There's, they're obviously all uh, writing in English, but pretty much you can look at it as a completely different language because the terms are different, the language is different, the intent is different in its grammatical structure. So in order for us to actually build any kind of an automation, we had to look at what can we do to understand what the intent is behind what the user is typing up as part of the scope, and then associate that with a whole bunch of um, construction tasks uh, from a catalog. So that was the, it, it's a fairly complex problem to solve because it's just not about not understanding English language. It is being able to actually identify based on the language, different sets of data. And that's where the complexity has been. And um, what we did as Gordian as a company is that when we engaged with CCG, um, we decided to have, in order to mitigate the risk, another team work on it on the same problem in parallel without actually identifying any kind of a solution. So when, when we arrived at the solution, the, the basis for the design was the same between two different teams. But CCUG was able to actually get us to a minimum viable product very, very quickly. Now, one of the other things that I think Brian didn't mention is that this is the first time that anybody has automated this kind of a process in using AI. And uh, you know, for us, this is like a big milestone for us because this is like, we can pretty much say that this is the world's first artificial intelligence engine that can automatically generate proposals based on a loosely structured uh, scope. Wow, so yeah. that's exciting. So, sorry, go ahead, Brian. Yes, I was going to say, you know, what, what Ray mentioned is really interesting and, uh, um, and kind of, you know, speaks to the theme of, of what we were, we were saying about, you know, what does adaptive machine learning look like? Um, and the approach that, that Ray was talking about um, is, it's called transfer learning. Um, and it's, it's sort of at the cutting edge of how natural language processing works today. So what we did is we actually took um, a, an English language model um, that was uh, created by Google. Um, and this English language model was, tr was trained basically to understand basic English by um, reading all of Wikipedia um, and performing a few sort of simple tasks. Um, and so that was our starting point. But, to, but like Ray mentioned, you know, this is not uh, a, a task just for uh, standard English. There's very much like a, a lingo, a, a specific language uh, to the construction industry. And so we had to take that English language model and get it to learn sort of construction speak. Um, and so the way that we did that is we took Google's model and we sort of cracked it open and said, okay, let's, um, and it's Google's open source model, right? So by cracking it open, we're not doing anything dubious, right? We're doing exactly what they wanted us to do with it. <laughs> Um, so we cracked it open um, and said, okay, what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this model that knows English, um, and now we just needed to learn sort of a twist on English, which is construction speak, construction English. Um, and because they had a mass quantity of data, um, which is historic scopes, um, historic written scope about construction projects that need to be done, we're going to teach this, um, this English language model, we're going to teach it construction speak by having it read through those, that specific text about construction and learn some of the vocabulary and some of the idioms and, and figure all that out. Um, and so the amount of proposals that it actually had to read through, it was um, over 100,000 different uh, scope texts. 
Um, I think we did some analysis around this from the beginning of the project that was it was going to take, if you were to ask a human to read that, it would be like 3,500 hours just to read the text, um, which is which is something on the order of like a year and a half in terms of work days. Um, and that's just to read the text, not even to like go back through and say, okay, what would the uh, what would the what were the tasks that were associated with that text, or what's really the relationships between all of this? Um, and so, by using machine learning, we were able to uh, develop a, a program that could essentially take in new information and categorize it, and say, okay, what tasks do we think are going to be relevant to this text? And we could do that within the cor a course of just a, a couple weeks, um, which was really, I mean. You know, you could hire someone to read all these tasks and it would take a year and a half, um, you know, if they did nothing else at their job. We got there in a couple of weeks with machine learning. So uh, amazing stuff. I'm I'm so curious, but I, all the questions I have would take the rest of the time. Um, I want to kind of pivot to a different topic for a second, but re just real quick, when the rubber really hit the road, because that's a lot of incredible stuff you guys were doing, um, but and Ray talked about having that MVP. When we really got to the core of standing up, what you just talked about, what are we talking about there? Was it was it weeks, months? You know, just kind of high level. How long did that take to to kind of spin up that MVP? Yeah, so like weeks for an MVP, and then and then months for a production deployment um, is what we're looking at. So Brian, if I may add to that, uh, it's, uh, you know, that aside, one of the things that I do want to mention is that we actually pitted this AI against actual human building a proposal from scratch. And for a AI that was about three months old, it actually beat out somebody who had like close to 10, 15 years of experience in the construction industry. That, that, <laughs> like, that was like perfect. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, this AI is essentially, you know, perfect today. We, we were not, we were never going to yeah. expect it to be 100% accurate. But just the, the sheer volume of uh, reading through a scope and getting all the data out, uh, you know, uh, this AI did a lot better than a human did in, in terms of not only time, but also in terms of accuracy. And that was what is uh, is the key behind all this thing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you added that in, right? Because when, when I, when I kind of heard you describing the story, I'm like, you know, wow, okay, that's clearly a valuable um, asset to the company. And, and hearing you kind of talk about that kind of metric, right? Um, and, you know, uh, our audience can map it to, to their business. But uh, even for me, I, I, mean, I, I, I knew the answer to some degree. But for me, when I hear that, I'm like, wow, did that take years to build? So it was great to know that that's something that could happen in a pretty accelerated fashion as we all map it to our current needs, which uh, leads me to kind of the, the next question. So whether from you know the specific kind of scenario product you're talking about or, or any other angle, how, how do you see you know this AI um, solution shifting um, based on the impacts of, of COVID in our current crisis? I think uh, Brian. Because, sorry, well, Brian. Go first. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I, I, you know, at least what we are experiencing. Again, this is something that will probably change by almost on a daily basis based on what's going on. Uh, but we are experiencing what customers are a little bit more anxious about cutting their time that they, that they are usually okay with in terms of getting some projects completed. So which means that they would want to have efficiencies built in in every part of their business, part of their uh, solutions. So having an automated solution is timely. It wasn't uh, something that we had timed it to a pandemic. But this is what we are actually noticing is that people are a lot more interested in, let's see what we can do things faster than what they were comfortable with. Oh, it's gonna take a month, it's fine. Or two months, it's fine. So, so that is something that at least I've actually started to notice is that people are looking for automation. Wow, that's great. I, and I, uh, Brian, you chime in next, but just the, the correlation came to my mind, our, our next speaker is actually in the retail industry, but kind of similar to a lot of retailers that had already been in front, lucky or smart, of, of having their e-com channels set up or delivery, whatever the case may be. Um, it sounded like it, it, it turned out to be a real competitive advantage for you guys to have this in place because that's what your, your customer base now needed um, kind of during this time. What would you like to add there, Mr. Beasley? Yeah, so I think um, 
you know, again, this sort of gets back to the the notion that, I mean, the whole idea of machine learning AI is is the ability to adapt um, to to massive shifts in information. And so we've we've done it once, right? By by taking plain old vanilla English and teaching it construction speak. Um, one of the things that is is a best practice and something that you see mature machine learning solutions do is adapt to new data over time. Um, so that as there are shifts in the underlying data, um, your your program is robust and it can it can evolve with the environment. And so in this case, I mean, we might start seeing new construction scopes come in with vocabulary you've never seen before. Like prior to March or April, you probably never saw a construction scope that would have said this solution needs to be social distancing friendly, right? Or um, or we're probably going to see an uptick in things like, you know, the requirement for sanitation stations or those sorts of things, right? That's going to be a new phenomenon in the data that we need to account for. It is and funny so, that you mentioned, it's funny yeah. that you mentioned that. That's exactly what Gordian is doing. We have to actually release a biohazard uh, data set. I mean, we never had that. Personally, we never had that. We had some, but not a lot. And now we have to increase our data set. And that is something that we'd have to train our AI system to support. Uh, this is like exactly what you said. We need to train AI system to support new vocabulary. Yep, yep. And so, so that's exactly. So, we'll be looking at how do we need to design, adjust the system to 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 be able to take those inputs and intelligently respond with. Okay, given this new vocabulary that doesn't exist for most of history, so we can't really look back on, you know. 15 years of social distancing and okay, what sorts of tasks showed up in a social distancing scenario that doesn't happen. So how do we take in all, all of the new instances of that and begin to really quickly adapt to that and put together good construction proposals going forward? And this is true for humans as well. Even if we didn't have an automated system, it takes some you know humans to understand this new data set. And you know who's faster, at least we have seen that AI is a little bit faster, uh, but you know, that is something that we would have to actually contend with as we go along. So I would love if we have more time, of course, uh, with a few minutes left. What, what about the flip side of that? So I, I think we can all map to the value of kind of having um, an asset like this. What about internally the change management, the adoption, right? So we build these things and then you've got to have other leaders, user uh, you know, operators use this. Um, speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Ray, you want to so, kick us off? Sure. Um, so the <laughs> the way we designed this, uh, you know, I'm not saying that we were, uh, we were looking at the uh, crystal ball and thinking that this is what will happen, but the way we designed this whole solution is that we call this an assistant. So what this does is uh, this right. is, it'll actually help a user. It's not going to take over people's jobs. It is. It'll just help them move faster, go faster, make decisions faster because everything is available for them. And there is no bias when it actually, you know, comes to selecting data sets. You're not actually having a contractor trying to sneak in a few extra line items to make some extra money. You know, it, uh, an AI system. Uh, okay, it can be thought uh, to make some of those, uh, you know, additions, but typically speaking, the AI system is not designed for that kind of thing. So. That's essentially what makes it a little bit easier for us to actually go to market as saying that this is an assistant that will help you get things done faster. I think Brian mentioned something about it takes about 60 days. Our expectation is that this assistant will help cut that down, you know, by maybe, you know, by 20 days. Even if it's 20 days, it's a lot of, you know, time that we are saving for our uh, customers. Yeah, and, and to extend the point of this being, you know, really viewed as an assistant, you know, Ray mentioned some of the sort of A-B testing that we did. It was it was it was actually sort of A-B-C testing, right? So we did just the AI and just the human, um, and the AI's numbers were just slightly better. But we also did a version that was a human assisted by the AI agent. So here's um, here's the AI's first pass, and there's sort of some interaction between the two. And that C, that that joint effort, was the clear winner in terms of um, actually getting a, a first pass at a proposal that was the closest one to the final proposal. So it, it, it's, it's really, a, it's a tool to, to help support people in their jobs. 
Love it. Well, hey, I uh, thank you both um, for the time. Sorry it was a short window. Maybe uh, on our next go round here, we'll we'll give more time to be able to dive deeper. But really great stuff. Um, I, I think everyone can can understand if they hadn't already. Um, you know the the real kind of tangible value uh, when we say these words like data science and AI. Um, so thank you both very much. Um, we're going to shift to our next topic now. And then if, if you guys are able to stick around, that'd be great. Um, towards the end of the session here today, we're going to open up for Q&A. Um, so we'll try to queue those up. But thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, Thanks. Marianne, if you, thank you. Appreciate it, Ryan. And Marianne, if you'd like to uh, put Mr. Derringer on, it'd be great. Um, I know while we're shifting over, I, you know, Brian Beasley, um, when we were kind of doing our prep for this, you were, you had this phrase that stood out to me of unleash the robots, uh, or, you know, and that, that definitely resonated in the, the top of the guys hit so we can understand where it applies. Mr. Derringer, how are you today? Assess technology here. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, I can. Um, yes, disclaimer to the audience. Uh, we have a legacy technology we're using today in, uh, in GoToWebinar. Hopefully your experience is fair, but uh, at some point we'll certainly be transitioning as we already have internally to the Microsoft Teams platform. Um, <laughs> since, uh, since Chris has joined us uh, today from Seattle um, as a leader of the retail industry group um, for Microsoft. So, Thanks for joining, and and I think taking some time uh, from your day off today. Uh, yeah, we um, in many of the things we do for uh, our our employees, one of those are um, focused around you know, obviously taking time and, and spending time uh, able to to be at home and adjust to a lot of these changes. So uh, within our teams, we you know try to put a four day versus three day weekend. <laughs> Uh, available for our folks. So, but I'm happy to be here today as um, and spending time with with you folks and customers and partners alike. Love it. That's great. Well, I definitely appreciate it. Um, so, you know, from a from a transition of topics, um, Chris, uh, as I said, runs the retail industry group. So, we're going to kind of hear some perspectives from that lens. Uh, whether uh, for the audience, whether you're in the retail industry or not, I think we all have, have learned for sure that any any business in any industry is kind of impacted from that. Um, and every industry is trying to kind of learn something from each other in terms of what they're doing to react and recover and leverage data analytics. So um, looking forward to the conversation. Chris, if you wouldn't mind, take, uh, take a quick moment to give an introduction of yourself. Uh, I haven't done it justice at this point. Hmm. No, sure, that's fine. So. Uh, I lead our U.S. base within Microsoft U.S. Uh, retail and consumer goods practice um, with inside of what we call enterprise commercial. Uh, and that's a mouthful, I guess. And, and what that means to demystify that is a bit um, that the, the team that I have uh, identifies and look at trends within the retail um, and consumer goods industry and helps our customers realize those with what, in whatever stage they're at along their digital transformation journey. Um, it will mostly, you know, our focus is going to be the top 500 retail and consumer goods across the U.S. So uh, at breadth, at scale, across many different sub verticals within that. So consumer goods, home improvement, electronics, C-store, uh, QSR, casual dining. Um, if I, I'm sure I, I missed or forgot one or two in there, but uh, those are the general sectors that we cover within um, within the industry. All right, great. Thank you. And I, I know... From your background, you've been uh, with Microsoft for quite a long time. I think maybe 15 years plus, something like that. So you've you've been through and seen a lot. And I'll, I, I've said this to just about anybody that knows me in the professional world, but I've, I've been very excited to be a partner of Microsoft's a lot um, due to uh, Satya Nadella and the, the things that he's uh, done there from a cultural perspective. So um, you know, if you want to weave any of that in, um, I, I I just personally think he's a great guy and had a great strategy, but yeah, if you can maybe kind of un unpack uh, where where you went there a little bit further, right? Like, how how do you view the the, the retail industry? How do you kind of break it out into different chunks and groups? Uh, I think right now, um, obviously, getting a sense of this whole essential versus non essential, um, which everybody's kind of aware of the terms now more than ever, um, and just kind of how you break things down, how how you're working um, to help um, you know the brands that you work with to 
understand where they're at and how they're going to map um, towards recovery. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so a few things to, to cover there, you know, just as mentioned, go back, I'm probably not quite at 15 yet, but uh, I do appreciate, I think they'll give me a, a statue or a crystal of some kind that will come through <laughs> when I cross the threshold. Yeah, I have been here for a minute. Uh, I spent, um, so I've been leading this practice for the last three years. Uh, before that, I spent five Black Fridays in our um, Microsoft retail store, so our direct channel as CTO there. So I think that's, you know, if you haven't been into one of our stores, specialty boutique um, consumer uh, electronics focused. Um, and smattering of roles before that inside of um, Microsoft. And, and prior to that, I did uh, six years over at Hewlett Packard, half engineering, half uh, category management sell through. And then before that, PepsiCo. So that sort of rounds out, um, uh, when I say PepsiCo, I mean PepsiCo bottling. So a distributor from rounding out consumer goods uh, to retail, at least from the avenue that we have. And then obviously inside of Microsoft, we're both a consumer goods company where we sell um, a lot of product through Walmart, through Best Buy, through many of our customers. We're also, as I mentioned, a direct channel. We've got about uh, 80 stores um, globally, uh, about a $5.2 billion business from that side. And I think if you look at both our direct and indirect channel, um, we're sitting somewhere around, I think 12 to 15 billion. Uh, and then obviously the, the enterprise business that we support, which supports many of our customers. Um, as you mentioned, Satya, yeah, he's been a great change agent and we definitely have seen through this that change in culture starts at the top. So that growth mindset is something that's been uh, delivered and driven inside of, of Microsoft and one that has seen definite change in how we evaluate uh, ourselves, how we work together within teams and how we approach our customers and market with that learning mentality. Um, so growth mindset's definitely a, of top focus, and, and we'll get. I think we can get into some of that uh, as we talk about. Um, you know, I think if, if you heard, you know, Satya has mentioned the the three stages of the three pillars that we we look at um, with regards to the market, right? Um, so there's the the reacting, recovering, and uh, reimagining. And, and if we break that down a little bit more, um, the reacting piece of that is you know navigating the now. Right. And so a lot of companies and people, as we look at the market, are definitely navigating that now. Uh, and as we see that, you know, across all sorts of different verticals from essential to non-essential, I'll get into that piece in a minute. Um, the, the four things we're seeing, you know, clearly are standing up of crisis centers and crisis responses. I think one of the best I've seen there out there today is, is 7-Eleven, where they have a, a massive franchisees, uh, a franchise development. So they have their own corporate standards that they have to deliver. They're an essential business because they deliver food, yet they also have um, a role to support the franchisees that you know live and die every day based on the revenue that they can drive and support and then the communities that they support that they're attached to. Um, so it was very important to them to build this center of excellence that aligned to their values, but also can support and give them the context and guidance that they need. Um, and so we've, we've partnered with them to, you know, if you think about all the, the changes to state, local, fed, uh, brand, policy, all of those that are changing, you know, nearly by the minute, uh, centralizing around uh, a central repository for that data. Um, you know, if you think about virtual assistants, AI, chatbots, um, virtual concierge is the ability to answer, you know, to put one answer out there at a time and have many people interact and answer those um, as they go through. So definitely seeing that as part of this area. Uh, protecting of employees and customer safety. That's also one and two. I put that together as a flip side of a coin um, because giving consumers and customers that confidence that your employees are safe and that they're set up uh, and and as well as not just that piece within PPE but you know digital PPE right um, how do you give confidence and audit that you have the right requirements around gloves around masks around plexiglass around support to to help reduce any um, contagions that are out there today. Um, so one on the employee side and two on the customer side, I think you've probably seen, you know, if you've gone out to any grocer, it's widely varied uh, as far as what's approved and what's not approved and what they can supply and what they can't. So there's definitely a um, an investment in that and a continued investment in that as, as we operate. You know, I think we flipped from the, the point was to, to land people in stores, spend more time there and give them a great experience to now, uh, you know, do as much as we can to uh, deliver products and goods outside of stores, limit the time in stores, right. yet still giving that great experience both digitally and physically. 
Uh, and that gets to reorienting of the business, right? To amplify the digital, to optimize inventory, to strengthen supply chains. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have seen in the market, uh, you know, there's different ways that we're talking about this moment. So in 1929, we we're familiar with the Great Depression. In 2008, due to the Lehman Brothers fall, I think we're very, um, uh, we remember the Great Recession. And a lot of markets are talking about this being in the 2020 COVID-19, the Great Acceleration. Right. So that's this idea. And I'm sure you've heard, you know, William Gibson's quote, the, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So those who have invested and hardened in their digital practice uh, will be those that are successful and not just able to react, but plan their 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 uh, recovery and shape that new normal. Um, a couple of stats on that, right? E-commerce growth in the U.S. penetration since 2009 has been roughly around a percent, right? Year over year, we've seen roughly, and in the last year, 2018 to 19, that almost got to 2% growth from about 14% to about 14.4 you know, to 16%. In the last eight weeks, right, uh, e-commerce uh, impact, right, uh, U.S. penetration has gone almost double from 16% to 27%. We thought that would be on a scale five years out. So when we talk about this acceleration and the digital acceleration, um, that is is true. And you can see that across many different stats. Um, grocer apps post, um, you know, are up 100 to 200% as far as sales go. Uh, we expect a lot of that to be permanent. Um, in this segment, online sales, specifically on grocers, at 20% uh, it grew after social distancing uh, guidelines came through, but post stimulus checks, it jumped as high as 40%. Um, digital meals, so if you look at social distancing there, those went up 25 to 100%. Uh, but after the stimulus checks, that went as high as 100 to 200 percent. You know, DoorDash being, you know, 200 percent of that with Uber Eats being 148. Uh, if I flip to the online market uh, for apparel, uh, you know, Stitch Fix has had 62 percent of that market, but overall it's dropped about 15. But if you look at companies like, um, let's say, Lululemon, who have been anchored and ready to move as Stitch Fix has, they've grown 200 percent, capturing 22 percent of that market. So shoppers definitely prefer that contactless touch in store, uh, have adopted and moved to e-commerce practices. And um, consumers will say that they'll get about 85% of consumers say they're going to continue that focus moving forward past COVID. So um, of the three pillars, I, I touched on one. Uh, I'll pause there, Brian, to see if yeah. you have any questions. I go to, you know, part two and three, which is the comeback and the new normal. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to derail you too much from from continuing down those two parts, but um, so much of what you said, I'd love to, to circle back on, but the, the, the one, right, I, I think you phrased it, the, the great acceleration. Um, so it, if, you know, my assumption is or big, big organizations, big retail brands that had that kind of in full swing prior to this, but moving at a moderate pace just found themselves accelerating it um, be, because of this. Um, are there any kind of two, two questions go whichever direction you like. Are there any kind of thoughts you have maybe for other retail organizations where it wasn't fully bought into, it wasn't kind of in motion and that maybe they felt some of it, like we, we got more done more quickly to train, change and transform, but we want to keep that going or kind of same question. What do you see those folks where that happened? What they're, it was, it was, it was in that react phase, right? It just happened. They, they had to get things done. So, so they did it and they accelerated. Now that we're two months in, what are what are they doing and thinking of to to make that continue and to kind of keep that pace going? Mm, yeah, so so there's in that stage of of navigating now, and I would say while while some of those larger uh, customers had that, um, uh, you would say some of that fuel and engine, I I I I'd hazard to say that they dabbled in it, right? Like when you look at sales, as I mentioned, as a percentage of your sales, if I just take e-com as an example. Um, you know, if 16% of the market, right, roughly, and that's going to be smaller or bigger, depending on the business is, you know, online and how you fulfill and deliver on curbside or any of those avenues, it's, it, it didn't get a lion's share. You might do have done it because your competitors did it and you wanted to, to provide offerings to that perspective. And it's a growing business to look at. Um, but there wasn't, you know, it just from a perspective of those large industries, it wasn't as big a focus. This doubled down on those initiatives. So the transition in investment to digital, to online, to predictive 
um, capabilities to cognitive services have just ramped right across those areas from I think innovation projects from ideals from you know we'll get there in about five or six years to if we are going to survive we have to deliver and execute against this right now um, and it's you know it, it's a challenge if you look at non-essential versus essential right um, and in the essential world they almost have a problem I think 8% stockouts were the average on shelves previously now those numbers have jumped to 280 percent as an average you know if we think about some of those things that are out there on shelf today um, so shelf analytics uh, hardening of your supply chain like and just even like there are presidents out stocking shelves in their stores there are executives out you know throwing product into trucks today right like just trying to keep up with demand so you know they've got one problem is is where am I and how do I focus just on on my core business and how do I evolve? Then you have the non essentials, which you know if you, if you've seen you know what J C Penney just announced, I think bankruptcy a day or so ago. Neiman's is is very close. Uh, you know if you think about Nordstrom REI, their sales have shifted from apparel to more equipment. Um, they you know or or Gap for example, those those companies have furloughed, have paused, has closed, and they really have to to you know in this time. Of, of noise that there's obviously a contraction and a shrinking of revenue but you have to uh, plan and adjust for you know your comeback so while the stores are closed we've seen some companies harden and look at things that they weren't able to do like upgrade or change to point of sale you know i think gamestop is a great example of this where their business has skyrocketed because you know as people stay home the the mm -hmm. online gaming business has, has tripled uh, and there was a strong concern from them of how much their digital practice versus their in-store practice will look, will look like. Um, so while you have this time down, um, there's definite acceleration and hardening of infrastructure and, um, and, your, and your forecasting models that, that weren't there today where this massive COVID thing came through and blew, blew up your market, um, which is kind of getting yeah. to plan to come back, right? So this building a recovery strategy, rethinking business portfolios, accessing market opportunities and identifying those, that's what people are starting to enter into now. And, what's, and it's been unfortunate that those non-essentials, it's funny, have had a little bit of more time to accelerate versus the essentials, which have just been slammed and are fulfilling. They'll start to come out of this, um, I would say probably a month or two later before we get to shaping the new normal. And that new normal as we reimagine is gonna be about what you're talking about is accessing shifts, putting digital at the center of the relationship, um, ideate on how we evolve products and services, and then really plan for that long term. Um, you know, COVID phase two could be, you know, here next fall. Uh, if, if, this, if this mutates and stays in that avenue and becomes, you know, what we call the new normal, right? There will be some adjustment, right? And, and as we've hardened both essential and non-essential, those, those pieces will definitely be, be prevalent. Yeah, yeah, you, you mentioned the, uh gaming thing back there my my uh, uh investment strategy internally for my family definitely shifted a lot with my son um during the covid crisis around gaming apparently it's cool to get desktop computers now which i i just thought was odd but <laughs> so he's excited about that platform, the gaming platform is definitely interesting right uh, i've never been yeah. a yeah. Uh, Fortniteer, but my two boys have trained me up over the last two months so while i'm still not nearly as good as I'd like, I'm, I'm getting better. So our our uh, our internal family dynamics around around the TV and gaming has has definitely increased. It is it is very interesting, and I I could tell a whole story about the whole Travis Scott doing his in-game virtual concert on Fortnite, um, which was just crazy. And of course, I'm sitting there talking to my son about all the the, the downstream business implications of it, and he's like, Dad, just stop, please, and um, so. So yeah, you, so you kind of shifted in, uh, you know, to the, those other two phases, your pillars and and recovery, right? So what, you know, I think I think it's table stakes at this point that um, everybody's trying to get a feel for when we'll open back up and when we'll recover, but no one knows for sure. You mentioned kind of the the, the relapse, if you will. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. What what is a you know what are the the few core areas a, a retailer's focused on right now to say, hey, look, there's only so much I can control and focus on. So when I talk about recovery, I'm using data analytics or whatever, and this is what I'm focused on because this is what I can, can control. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, there's four areas that we're looking at that right now, right? So the, the four areas 
uh, within non-essential and essential retail, and I'll talk about that. So that's one. Uh, employee needs evolving is two. E-commerce demand is three, and supply chain needs are four. So I'll kind of go into to both of the to all four of those for a second. Um, the essential retail, right? So at that, I mean, you, we've seen and heard, and I touched on this before. So curbside pickup has become number one in the market, right? If you didn't have, you know, we call Bopus, Boris, we're now, so that's buy online, pick up in store, buy online, return in store. Um, people have dabbled in that. We're not calling it Bopac, buy online, pick up at curb, right? Um, how are you, did you have the infrastructure to allow for that before? Uh, if so, right, um, how do you recognize and identify customers that come within your proximity or your environment? And then how do you deliver that directly to them uh, in a way that's um, both safe and environmentally secure? Um, the, the ship to home services, and you know, grocers will talk about this, uh, the, the largest cost to, you know, if we, you know, one is curbside, so you want to draw people close, which reduces some of those shipping costs, but the ship to home, the Instacarts, the Grubhub, the um, Uber Eats, right? Uh, a lot of folks have, have, have stepped into that water and like leveraged that or took in that shot in the arm with those services and those disruptors, um, but they're all operating at a loss right now, right? Just similar to Uber, right? It's a disruptive solution that they brought in at loss. Um, and and retailers who have adjusted to that and picked up those social, um, I guess those ship to home services, the fastest growing part of their business at this point is yielding the lowest amount of return. Um, I think we did a study in, with with Publix not too long ago um, that went through, and I think we saw like the Instacart um, uh, stir, uh, strike that they did didn't impact Instacart, it impacted Publix. All the negative Twitter feed went directly to them that their products weren't being delivered that the customers needed. Um, and that, margin that Instacart takes effectively makes online ordering and shipping a net revenue loss. So your fastest growing business that you've anchored yourself to is, is coming through at, at a loss leader. Um, you know, in, in six years, you'll be out of business. So we talk about it and, and help um, retailers and consumer goods companies understand that, that your data, your customer relationship, that ownership, while it takes an initial investment and pickup is for the long term, uh, in your your advantage. So I've got a whole series around, you know, how to look at that piece. Um, and then as you step through, you know, social distancing apps like uh, booking certain times in stores, when when can I attend versus when can't I? Uh, what do the lines look like? Uh, what type of health factors are around this area versus this store? All bleeds into autonomous shopping as well. Um, you know, what can I pick up and pull and order in my own versus adjusting to employees? That moves into the employee section of reshaping and organizing. So digital concierge, virtual assistants, new standards for physical um, folks that are out there. You know, just in our own retail stores, if I talk about our direct channel for a minute, uh, we closed stores on March 16th. And since then, you know, what we've been able to enjoy in Microsoft is uh, opposite of other retailers, 70% of our business is through e-com and through that channel versus about 30% is within our stores. So um, mm -hmm. as we shifted, our employees are able to, I think we had 317 and uh, 317,000 enterprise customers and have delivered 4,000 training sessions to them. So they've been able to talk about how we and what we've done and the products and technologies we use to enable many of these, many of our customers across, you know, as we mentioned, and, um, uh, the modern workplace, their enterprise uh, stature, uh, things of those nature. Um, just in reference before that, you know, across 8.5 months, it was just about those same numbers. So it's ramped up and we've been able to apply them in, you know, our, our support tickets for our online calls. So and in our demand centers and our fulfillment centers. So we've been able to pivot and transition from a store closure to other areas. And we think about swapping, it's, it's important for, you know, there's this demand of essentials, uh, that, that's got this demand of business and these furloughed business of non-essentials, how can we better tie up and connect those those employees? If I move over then to e-commerce, we talked about, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about before, subscription services is in there. Commerce and fraud is a big one. I think there's a percentage of about two to 3% of the market is, is impacted by e-commerce sales. And now that that's grown, that's a much larger percentage of business. So um, it, we look at and we adjust and we talk about how can we, better push through the valid uh, orders that are coming in, recognize and understand customers through that versus um, rejecting those and rejecting the right ones. And that's yielded some, some pretty um, valuable responses. I think we see about 10% increase in sales in that on any business. And then finally, when we look at supply chain leads, um, 
you know, and that that blending of all this together, product visibility, intelligent control towers, pricing forecasting. This is where a lot of the the predictive models and analytics for us start to come into play. I mean, data underlyingly supports all these pieces of your decision. So how the, the models and the forecasting models and the machine-based learnings have definitely been thrown at a whack of this. Very few of those have continued to move. And as we constantly train and update and look at the models of what those pieces look like, um, how would a second pandemic look? We now have hardened data on that. What would we look through an adjust and change? What leading market indicators can you bring in uh, across, you know, where, where does China sit? What type of demand does it look like uh, out in the Fed for interest rates? Um, all the, you know, what, what does um, hotel occupancy rates start to look like? What does sporting events start to look like? You know, how do we adjust and factor into this new normal and how do the, all those key indicators fit into the models to better predict? what we think our, our forecasting trends will be. Uh, in certain cases, yeah. post stimulus check, post COVID, we've been able to put a few of those things together and still in retraining the models, get back to 90, I'd say high 95 to 97% accuracy. Yeah, so somewhere Brian Beasley is trying to unmute his, <laughs> his, his microphone and say yes, what he said. I, I've, I've heard him mention a lot of different angles on, on We've got to retrain everything, right? There's totally different data sets that we've got to look at when we're talking about prediction. Um, let me ask this, uh, since you were just talking about that digital, if there's anybody I know that, that, that's got, uh, the closest thing to a crystal ball in the retail space, we, when you talk about e-com and digital and uh, BOPAC, I think, or BOPAS, I'm not sure, um, uh, th those kind of things, if, if I'm a retailer that I wasn't there, right? So, so like the last couple of months, uh, I wasn't there. I wasn't able to kind of capitalize on it the way I wanted to. I'm, I'm working on pivoting, but now we're at this juncture, right? Two, two, two and a half months in. What, what are your thoughts? Do, do you feel like, hey, you've got to stick with it, wh whether it's because of a potential relapse or just that's where it's going now, new norm, whatever buzzword, or is there a, hey, let focus on my core um, and kind of not that that digital and delivery channel um, and, and, and just focus on getting that bill back up. Um, yeah, I, I would imagine a lot of got to have a, a question of, is, is this kind of a reactionary, reactionary in the moment type of thing um, or, or is it where things are going to be now? I, the, the, the acceleration is there across the board and the consumers, you know, as we said, you know, we've seen this a trend in adoption to digital and 85% of them say that they're going to stay with that, right? So your consumer demand has now shifted in how they're reacting with each of the brands that they do today, right? Um, it definitely depends on what I'll say is sector or sub-industry. So if I'm food service, if I'm grocery, right? Uh, to a degree apparel, that there are certain things that you know I think are still require brick and mortar right to what degree like i'm still going to like to feel a couch i'm still going to like to feel a bed right and mm -hmm. i may try on certain things like i haven't my wife and i very much differ she orders a lot of you know uh product from zoo lily for shoes and other products i've got to try it on <laughs> and feel it even though i know it can return it to me it's it's worth that piece so there's certain things that will still have an in-store uh touch and a um your core business will stay, but it, it's definitely shifting uh, really quickly with, as I mentioned, food, uh, food delivery, grocers, all those where people uh, prefer and have found the great ease and value of that ordering online and getting that Bopus Boris or Bopac uh, pieces. So those shifts have accelerated and definitely would be here to stay. As the non-essentials come back into the market, right? Um, I don't think we have enough data just yet to determine where and how much of that will shift. Uh, but I believe, right, that at least 50% of that will will move back, will move over. So as mentioned, it, people have dabbled and, and they have certain components in, in e-commerce and have built these up over the last couple of years at a, you know, slow or innovation pace or at a science experiments mm -hmm. pace. But here, those type of pieces are becoming hardened just as much as your point of sale is, just as much as your, you know, marketing organizations deliver. Like these aren't science experiments and innovations anymore. This great acceleration, as we talk about, are, you know, the, the market and consumers have gotten used to this um, and want to see that move forward. I think what's really interesting for me is how consumer goods companies will adjust 
to subscription-based services or direct services. Um, you know, a lion's share of their customers are the grocers, are the C stores, all the restaurants. Uh, but what will, how will a Pepsi, how will a Mars, how will a Coca-Cola, how will a Procter & Gamble uh, adjust to a lot more of these online orders? Will, how much of that percentage will change in the channel for their customers, the retailers versus that direct uh, model? Because I think them building brand affinity and connection with their consumers is definitely the next wave of focus. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, we're just about done with time. I can't thank you enough, especially taking time off your day off. Maybe one quick parting thought. If I'm a leader and executive in a retail organization, be it a book, a blog, a person, um, I, I don't know, any, any last kind of word of advice? There's all these things we talked about. Just one key thing. Hey, here's something you can leverage that can help. Yeah. Um, well, one thing. <laughs> You, we ran out of time and I run through 12, right. but I mean, I think there is a heart, you know, you, there's, there's been some investments in this area, double down on, on your digital, double down on hardening and digitaling your acceleration, right? Um, you might've played with, dabbled with, looked at your predictive models, gone through analytics, touched on AI, uh, only, you know, maybe piloted it in a few stores, uh, double down on that right that investment right while difficult in some cases right now will yield spades as we come out of this new normal and as we shape and plan like make sure you plan the comeback and harden that pop comeback because this new normal will continue the, the old world's gone and it will continue to adjust as you know that then if the next wave comes in the fall or if it doesn't but but consumer behaviors have changed their appetites have changed and and make sure that you know be relevant because you know we've seen giants in the market right today fall uh, in and out and and we don't you know we definitely want to see 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 our best brands stay there as as giants right no doubt all right man well hey I really appreciate it if you feel like dialing back in an hour and sharing a beer and uh, saying hello and answering your questions uh, feel free otherwise have a fantastic Memorial Day weekend I appreciate it thanks um, appreciate it thanks. Marianne, if you'd like to uh, bring up Mr. Rodriguez and Mrs. Greenwood, I will dispense Clever with whatever whatever transition I was going to do and hand it to you so that you guys can get through it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, incredible stuff. I I need a nap now after uh, the water hose or the fire hose of Chris Derringer, but always love to hear from him, so I appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, let's jump in. I have with me the um, many roles at CCG. She's been the director of strategy. She's been a client partner. I prefer to think of her as the queen, captain, and boss of governance. So welcome to the party, Natalie. Thank you. Hi. Um, so it's funny, this uh, conversation was titled Gin and Governance, and I had a laugh about that because a, a fun fact, uh, when I think of gin, you know, I think of it used to be like Nana's drink. You know, it was what um, my grandmother drank when I was a kid that I thought smelled like pine salt. Um, and then, and recently in, in 2018, actually, it was the largest growing uh, beverage category. And so I had a laugh when I thought about governance. And I thought, you know, governance used to be the drink of IT only. Um, and now it's become a very popular drink across the entire business. Uh, and I think that was even pre COVID. So, in your experience and, and all the client experience uh, that you have, why is governance uh, gaining traction right now? Yeah, yeah. So I would say in the last probably year and a half, we are hearing more and more about governance and, and mostly it's because of this, this new concept of data privacy. So folks are, are starting to uh, get very serious about how, and, and frankly, there's laws around it, how you're going to manage personal information. Um, from a retail perspective in Europe, GDPR, um, General Data Protection Regulations came out, and that was a big deal for companies that were not prepared for that. There were global organizations mm -hmm. like Starbucks is a good example, where you know if they, they had to kind of get their ducks in a row as it relates to managing and tracking customer data so that in the event that they were asked to a customer asked to opt out or wanted their data to be deleted from the systems, they have a systematic way to, to do that. Um, there's a lot of cost associated with not having those controls in place. I wrote down the number here. So compliance costs projected for GDPR regulations are projected at $55 billion. So you can imagine wow. what companies are trying to do now to scramble 
to get in line and, and start to make sure their systems and their data are protected and that they can react um, as they need to. And it's not just GDPR. So that's, yes, that's European. And if you're a retailer or an organization that, that's housing at European data, customer data, but it's also now in California with the CCPA. Washington's about to um, drop a new law. Florida's drafting one right now. It's in legislation for approval. And so we have all these different states that are taking a different approach to how they want to manage and regulate customer or personal identifiable data. And so we're going to have to, companies are going to have to respond to that. And they're going to have to create that logic to um, really account for that and make sure that they're, they're, they're taking it seriously or there's going to be a lot of costs associated with it. And, it's, and just when, you know, data was getting so easy to manage across all of your source systems, um, adding in uh, compliance and government regulation is, is what everyone's dreaming for, I'm sure. Yeah. So, Time. so we've moved into this COVID area um, and it's really highlighted the, the resiliency and the risk um, that can come about in new situations. So as these last couple months have progressed, and I know you've been extremely busy over these last couple months, what kind of conversations are you having and what are people concerned about right now? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the, the clients that are reaching out to us, both current and prospective clients, um, are really worried right now about the remote, remote workforce and the fact that they weren't always enabled to have all of their employees work remote. While most companies had, you know, a handful of folks that, that had the capability and availability to do that, there were a lot of organizations that simply just never, that never was something that they considered. So, you know, all of a sudden overnight, the federal government said, you know, we've got to go into this lockdown and companies had to very quickly go into their assets and start to pull you know pull up laptops and prepare them to send home with people that in the past had never never had to do that so there's no controls in place this is a last minute thing that they're trying to scramble to just get the technology in, in workers hands so that they can actually get them home and, and you know um able to take action and do their day jobs but things that weren't considered because it was so last minute were the controls around that so what does that mean to the, the company and how we're securing and protecting our data and our assets. So in the past, if you're an employee that's never had a laptop that left the building and you were always a desktop user, all of a sudden you've been called to the office to pick up your laptop, you're taking it home, and you may not know what you're allowed to do or not to do with that laptop. Um, a good example um, I heard on, on one of our last forums is, you know, we, we sent all these folks homes with these laptops. Uh, actually it was Lee Crump at Rollins that mentioned it and he said, we, we didn't have any controls in place for how to um, update their security patches because they're not on the, inter on the network. So we had to scramble to figure that out. We didn't have documentation or planning around that. And so they were scrambling to do that. Um, other folks that have called me and said, hey, I need you to look at my data usage policy because I'm not sure that I'm covered when my, these assets are leaving the company and that my employees are even aware of what they can and cannot do with that, those assets and with the data that's stored on those assets. Mm -hmm. So Dan, things like, and people just, you don't always think about this, but things like don't leave your computer in a hot car. Uh, not only is it bad for the computer, but it could be stolen and that's theft. You, ha you have a, an issue where your data and all the information on that computer could be easily stolen if someone accesses that machine. Um, the other example is I'm, I'm working from a kitchen table right now. And so if I don't know that the company policy is I need to control, you know, alt delete, lock my machine every time I walk away from it, I've got these home offices where, you know, people could potentially be coming in and out and they can access any data that I have access to if I haven't locked that machine. Those are just policies that, that typically you would have in place, but not at this level where, where we're at now, where everybody across the organization needs to understand what it means to be a good data citizen and what you have to do to protect yourself and the company from theft of, of information. Mm -hmm. And and so much of that ties in as we talk about CCPA and GDPR. Um, there's obviously some very nuanced um, components to that of um, being forgotten and some of the other components, but just with data privacy, um, especially in what we do and helping folks with analytics and helping folks with reporting, it's so often that folks like to print things out, right? So they create these reports, they print information out, they carry the report with them. As the airports are, are opening back up, I'm in the airport, I have my report, I leave it on the table, walk away. You know, yeah. some of these things can be can be pretty critical. And so 
So what's the what's the first step for those folks um, as they're trying to get a handle around risk and, and resiliency? What is the guidance that you're giving them? Yeah, so right now I'm working with three different clients on updating their policies. So what we're doing is we're doing a, a high level assessment of their existing policies as it relates to data. So data um, assets, data management of those assets, data usage policies, remote workforce policies, uh, general data um, citizenship policies. And we're gonna get those updated and we're gonna make sure that they include information about potentially having this information leave the office, the building when in the past it had not. And so we're, we're doing the, those assessments now. We're gonna help them rewrite those policies. We're working with their legal team to understand what are some of the changes that we need to be considering because we're not lawyers. There, there's a limit to what we're aware of and what, what's coming from the top down, from the government down in terms of what needs to be considered. But that is probably the biggest thing right now is let's just make sure at minimum, you can't control everything. If an employee truly, uh, wants to do something wrong with the data or they, they want to you know be insubordinate they, they're going to do that I, I could literally take a picture of a screen shot right now and blast it on social media with somebody's personal data I can't stop all of those kind of things but I can have a policy and I can at least attempt as a company to protect myself by saying this is our rule of law at this company and if you break that and we we prove that you weren't adhering to these policies through audit auditing and systematic checking, you may not have a job with us. This is very serious. So that's step one, for sure. Step and two then, is gonna be the systematic controls, getting those put in place. And how do, as they, as clients are putting um, policies in place and they're educating folks on what this new normal is. Um, so as they come out of that reaction mode and they start to put this in place, um, what are thoughts on training? Are, are, uh, are they, ready for training? Are they ready to train their remote workforce or is this also a gap that they're concerned about? Oh yeah, no, it's it's a big gap. You know, I was thinking back to when SOX was a big deal. I, I think it was now probably 15 years ago, which is really aging me, maybe longer, but I was working at Ford Motor Company at the time and we had to go through rigorous training at every single employee every three months to understand what it meant to the company, to us, what we can and cannot do with the data. And so we had to we had to hunker down. They had to you know, have their learn, learning department put together modules. The employees had to take the time to take the test. We had to measure adherence and make sure that it was happening and managers had to address anybody that was either not taking the, the training and certifying that they took the training or adhering to it. I mean, it was a, it was a thing. I think that's what's gonna happen next. I, I don't think there's any way to avoid this. We we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect our employees. We have to protect our customers and their data and information. We have to be good data citizens. So this, this concept of, of ongoing training, repeated training, certification, if you wanna call it, that says, hey, I took the training, I understand it. I took a little quiz, I'm good. I'm certified for the next three months is great but we have to do that on a regular basis and continue to remind people, especially as those policies continue to change, what that means to them and what they should and should not be doing. Absolutely, great advice. And so, you know, I teased out in the beginning uh, kind of with a poor analogy between gin and governance, but I, I teased out the that governance was historically driven by IT and that IT was of the governing mindset. And I think managing risk um, and, and protecting the business systematically is something that's very natural for IT. Um, so let's shift into, from a business standpoint, uh, we know that we're seeing a lot of folks now talking about governance for growth. Um, and they're talking about governance for communication and for capabilities in accelerating and really enabling um, a lot of the work that we're helping them with around data, around analytics, et cetera. So um, kind of switch lanes a little bit and talk about where this is not just about risk and resiliency, but where it can really be a catalyst for growth. Yeah, yeah, so so there's also a large opportunity here for efficiencies, and that's always been the case with governance. It's always taken a backseat to every other project or every other shiny object that's happening in the workforce. But the reality is with governance and with metadata management and having your processes and procedures documented, you can reduce a lot of the swirl that you have around things like we're talking data and analytics around data quality issues or concerns and questions that you may be getting about the data that you're receiving in a report that you're trying to consume and maybe you don't understand. We've been trying for years to get organizations to take steps and to be more proactive in providing that level of metadata. Well, here we are, COVID, everyone's working from home. 
I can't just tap someone on the shoulder next to me and ask a question about a metric that I'm pulling from a database. I mm -hmm. have to actually coordinate that now. I have to either set up a call or a webinar or some other way to have a discussion. It's really, it's really time consuming. Whereas in the past, truly, you could just walk to another cube and have the conversation. That's that's gone. So now the need for having that documentation is it's a must have. And I have companies reaching out to me saying, oh my God, do I need a metadata technology tool? Do I just need to put some processes and procedures in place? Or do I just need people putting their head down and documenting their roles? And I'm saying it's a little bit of everything um, because you are behind the eight ball in this and we do need to catch up so that your remote, remote workforce can be as effective as they would be if they were in the office. We need to enable them. I think it's such a fascinating piece and, and anyone who's worked with data from either side of the table um, or from any side of the table, it is now a language um, and it is a different language. And, you know, as someone who's often going into organizations who are immature around data, um, we have to be able to translate to them what we're talking about and what this new way of communicating is. Um, and I know uh, I've often heard you talk about data literacy and that, that part of it. So is data literacy a part of data governance in your mind and, and how does that play into kind of the policies, procedures, and what you're talking about. No, it absolutely is. It's actually in, in the CCG methodology that we use for measuring and assessing organizations with data governance, we consider data literacy a big component of that. If people don't understand what governance is and how to use data and how to not use data, um, they're gonna struggle. So the whole intent with that is to raise data literacy across the organization, provide that level of training and input so that they understand not only why it's important and buy into data governance and help support it, but also so they can do their jobs and be more efficient and make better decisions with the data that they're seeing because they're more confident in what, they, what, they're, what they're viewing. So this has been a huge topic in the last couple of weeks. Um, I've actually, I've got a client right now talking to me about, I need to do more training around a certain subject area because in the past, these folks all sat in the same space and they were able to just work together in tandem to, to create reports in an ad hoc fashion. And that's no longer the case. And they are, they're really, inefficient right now because of lack of documentation and just lack of general understanding of the data across the different folks because when you had everyone in the same space you could have a SME on finance a SME in marketing a SME in whatever data um, subject domain that, that they're they're SME of and they can cr they can share that information just sitting in a room but they're no longer sitting in that room and so now you have to know a little bit about everything in order to create the metrics that you need to do your job it's it's definitely changing. It's actually something, um, you know, I'm probably one of the people that you shunned um, in your past because I was the guy saying 10 years ago, we'll get to the governance in, in a minute. Um, but what's fascinating about it, not about it, the story that we're creating with our clients is everyone has heard the, the analogy that we used to spend 80% of our time getting the data together and only 20% of the time doing the insights. And we can shift that now. We have proven methodologies to shift that. But now we're creating, there's so many insights and there's so much happening that I still have to be able to communicate what I'm doing. And I have to be able to communicate complex things with AI or with ML that we're putting in place. And I have to find a way to explain that. And now if I'm spending 80% of my time explaining all the insights and only 20% of the time being able to do the insights, we're just creating new challenges. And so it's almost the Rosetta Stone of data. We need to have people learning and training themselves so that we can speak that common language. It's easier with tech than it is with people, but if we truly want the empowerment, which is the ultimate goal, is to empower these employees with the results and the insights we're creating, we can't do it if they're not speaking the same language. And I think it's a fascinating part of governance and I think it's gonna be one of our biggest focus areas for um, our clients as we go forward. Absolutely, um, you know, Dan, real quick on that topic, I mean, you bring yeah. up a really good point because one of one of the other things that I'm hearing from clients right now, oh, hi, I see Jason joined. Hi, Jason. <laughs> one of the other things, um, you gotta love virtual meetings. <laughs> one of the other things I'm hearing from clients is, um, I feel like ever since the, the workforce went remote, IT is getting, especially the BI department's getting inundated with calls about data quality issues. I'm looking at a report and I, it's not right. I'm in finance, I know my numbers, it's, it's not right. And they're just, they're really frustrated and they're feeling like, what, what is happening? Are people really creating reports yeah. that are wrong? What in reality, as we're starting to dig into some of these things, that's not the case. What it is, it's a, 
it's a, a perception that the data is wrong simply because there was no metadata on that report to explain the source, the author, the timestamp, and date it was run. All those, those metrics and facts that are going to help you understand what you're consuming are not on there because, again, we're so behind with governance and metadata management and, and enforcing that as part of a, a distribution of any report or a dashboard that goes out that now it's really starting to hit the fan, if you will. I mean, people are, the IT department's about had it with, with taking calls because they'll do the due diligence, they'll go back and they'll review the analytics and they'll say, it's right. The data's not wrong. It might yep. be wrong based on how you thought they pulled it, but it's right based on how we pulled it. So that's just been an interesting dynamic I've seen as well. Absolutely. I think I think it's incredible insight. Well, thank you so much, Natalie, for all your insight, for helping us understand the value of governance pre-COVID and then kind of the different conversations we're having with COVID. Um, always fascinating. And I do think this is a critical catalyst as we look to continue to help organizations adapt and grow with data. So from there, I'll hand it back over to you, Mr. Rimes. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. I, I think just about every time I listen to Natalie speak, I'm ready to charge whatever hill she tells me to charge. Um, I love the, love the passion. I think she might have single-handedly uh, created a lot of organizations' uh, prior, prioritization of data governance. So thank you both. Uh, hopefully we don't end up with some kind of weird gin and laptop policy out of all that but uh, um, so welcome Jason and John and Brian uh, joining us again um, we're gonna shift to a little panel discussion um, around cash revenue liquidity from a variety of different perspectives um, mr. Kurtz if you wouldn't mind to uh, kick us off with a quick introduction of yourself yeah good afternoon everyone happy to be here with you all uh, and I don't have my gin yet, but I do have a bottle of wine over here that's ready to go and some martini <laughs> glasses for, for when we get going here a little bit later. So uh, uh, Jason Kurtz, I'm a managing director at Excel KKR. Uh, we are a private equity firm that invests in B2B software and tech-enabled services businesses in the middle market. So kind of think 10 to 15 million in revenue on the low end and 250 million in revenue or so on the high end. Um, been with the firm about seven years, and prior to that, I worked uh, at a software company called Ariba in the procurement space. And uh, before then, I uh, spent some time with the uh, Convergence team, uh, Brian and company at Anderson in the uh, consulting practice. So glad to be here today. Yeah, I appreciate you joining us. And maybe uh, when we get to the happy hour portion, we can talk a little bit about our days at Arthur Anderson in Nashville. Um, Mr. <laughs> Joes, would you mind? Uh, saying hello to the group and uh, giving a little introduction to yourself. Hello, group. Uh, my name is John <laughs> Joes. I'm a senior finance director for Headington Companies, which is a, a single family office headquartered here in Dallas. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to the standard financial portfolio management uh, with uh, allocations in various asset classes and strategies, uh, we also have uh, fully uh, owned and operated uh, arms across uh, retail, hospitality, uh, food and beverage, uh, and uh, oil and gas, uh, and media. So uh, kind of a, an interesting conglomerate run out of a, a, an SFO here. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I When I, when I reached out to John originally um, to invite him to participate today, I my light bulb didn't come on as it should have before the call. But about halfway in, I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Oil and gas, restaurants, hotels, and uh, physical store retail. It's probably been an interesting time for uh, for you the last couple of months. Um, so he definitely shares some unique perspective. And then, of course, we have uh, Mr. Beasley joining us again, who um, you've already met. And uh, I will add, in case he didn't say it before, but... Uh, in, a, in a prior life, he spent a lot of time in the financial services industry, so he's got a, a unique perspective from there. Um, so, team, uh, cash is king. Um, kind of sort of a no-brainer. Um, I, I think, you know, of course, all, any business has always known that, but I think the crisis has taught us a, a new variation of that phrase, right? I mean, it's, it's the lifeblood of survival right now. Um, so I'd love to just kind of kick off the discussion with each of your unique unique perspectives around what what that means right now right so what what am i what am i doing to understand what i've got to 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 monitor and manage 
what I need to have and just kind of start to, to grasp what I need to do as I'm reacting, recovering, and starting to kind of claw back out of, uh, of this crisis. Um, so, Mr. Kurtz, if you'd like to start us off, I'd love to get your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share uh, at least how one uh, private equity firm thinks about it. And, I, you know, I think it's a, just from a contextual perspective, important to think about the world and why does it matter what one private equity firm might think about um, how to deal with, with this uh, pandemic that we're going through. But I think the important thing to think about is the vast change in ownership of, of companies in the U.S. and around the world that is being driven by private equity today. And a greater and greater percentage of companies are owned by pri private equity firms. Uh, if you look back, just to give you a little context, since data is king here, I'm sure as well, besides cash. But uh, um, in 2000, there were about 7,000 publicly traded companies in the U.S. Today, there's about 4,000. Uh, and if you look back in um, deal value of private equity transactions buy and sell in 2000, it was about $190 billion. This year, or sorry, in 2019, it was about a trillion. Uh, so you just think about the magnitude of the change uh, and the amount of companies that are owned by private equity today. Uh, it's pretty staggering. So it is, it, and many of you who are uh, in companies and clients of uh, CCG may be owned by private equity firms as well. So how we think about it, hopefully, is at least a little bit relevant for you guys. Um, as Brian said, you know, cash is king. So what did that mean? What did we do when we started to see what was going on from a pandemic perspective? And, and really, the first thing was gather data. Um, so we were trying to get a handle from our company's perspective of what they were seeing from a bookings or new sales perspective, what they were seeing from a retention of their customers perspective. Um, what their cash flow looks like based on collections and payables um, and start to forecast that out in a much more detailed way, but also, you know, running a, a series of sensitivity analysis. What if bookings are down for 20 percent for the next six months? What if it's a year? What if it's two years? What about retention? If it does this, if it does A or B. So a series of just mo sensitivity modeling to try and understand various scenarios and what the impact would be from a cash perspective. In our, in our company's ability to meet their covenants. From that analysis, we basically tiered all of our companies into red, yellow, and green and started doing a weekly analysis and, and kind of flash reporting uh, across each of those metrics to try and understand um, how our companies were performing relative to the different scenarios that we had modeled and kind of keeping a constant, literally weekly drumbeat of review of, uh, of the cash position. Yeah, that's... Great perspective. And I know as, as we had talked kind of leading up to this, I was kind of realizing, reflecting that, uh, you know, I, most of my time is kind of spent just uh, interacting and talking with, with customers, prospects, folks in the marketplace. And there, there's certainly been a big trend, as you just noted, of, of kind of that um, PE firm acquisition uh, move, as well as just uh, consolidation of different brands underneath certain conglomerates and even organizations that um, almost, even if there isn't PE in play, almost um, feel like one because they have so many different divisions. And John, I think you've got an interesting perspective uh, there, uh, given kind of the, the varied portfolio. When these last couple of months, um, you know, what what are either the challenges or the ways you tackled or, or <laughs> what what you feel like you you need to have right now when it comes to the information that you've got to get daily, minute, hourly, whatever the case may be, to, to, to monitor liquidity and cash? Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing that's kind of been driven home uh, for us over the last uh, few months has been, and I realize, you know, as a finance guy, this hurts me a little bit to say because it doesn't involve, uh, you know, strict financial engineering or, or uh, you know, data metrics, what have you, uh, is how critical your mission statement is for the group um, for the company and that everyone is on board with it and understands exactly that what the language means that you know you can have the same language but you could have multiple interpretations of it everyone has to be in sync with uh with what the mission statement of the organization is for us being involved in so many different verticals um it really uh, kind of drove home and, and forced us to ask ourselves some, you know, what might be somewhat uncomfortable questions uh, that you have to kind of confront. Uh, you know, economics is the allocation of scarce resources, in this case, uh, capital. 
And so it's really kind of a fundamental uh, issue that you're faced with as an organization uh, is where do we allocate our scarce resources? Uh, and secondarily, uh, where do we uh, where do we source that liquidity uh, for us as a single family office? Um, you know, is it uh, is it asset divestitures? Is it um, you know liquidity uh, lines that we could tap? Um, what are the uh, um, what are the the organizational assets? And again, as a single family office, a little bit of a unique situation. What are the assets of the principal? Uh, understanding your sources of liquidity and aligning those with how you want to continue business after the crisis, and understanding exactly where you want to invest now for the future, uh, all while simultaneously making sure that coming out of the crisis, you're gonna have a liquidity war chest as well, so that you can take advantage of opportunities that that you come across. So um, that that soft you know, focus on, on corporate governance um, and, and mission statement it is really, really critical and you can't properly manage liquidity uh, without being on board on that. Yeah. Um, and Brian or uh, BZ, before before we get to you, let me circle back real quick because I, I kind of want to double click a little bit on on the topic with both you guys. Um, so Jason, when you know when we talk a little about it, I think you said the phrase, you know, really it's a data story. So what 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 are you either having your portfolio customers do or just seeing uh, like just kind of breaking it down to nuts and bolts? What does everybody have to focus on? Right? Everybody, you know, we, we've got to monitor, monitor our financials, but what, what were the gaps that got accelerated now and will need to continue to get accelerated in terms of pulling together the right information for your board, your PE, whatever the case may be, and, and just kind of what's the emphasis there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it really, for us, struck home, you know, we have 50 companies in our portfolio, so everyone is in a little bit different stage of their life cycle. Some are better prepared to handle, you know, data requests from from a board and some are not as well prepared. Um, and so I think it just exasperated that, uh, you know, it, it became clear who could respond and be really flexible and uh, responsive, you know, on an hourly or daily basis. And those who took a lot longer and the ones who aren't prepared, um, you know, we're clearly going to need to make some investments in those to be able to um, to manage going forward. And so I think it just it, you know, highlighted that even more so for us and really made it probably, um, in some cases, having that data at your fingertips and easy to use and maneuver was a nice to have, but now it's a must have uh, in this environment, in this world. And so I think that's kind of how we've thought about it. Um, and, it, it, you know, I think the other part of your question is just tactically, um, you know, what was the data? I think for us, it's a lot about meeting metrics um, and trying to understand what's coming versus the financial statement tends to be a reflection of what's happened in the past over whatever period of time you're looking at it. So for us, it was much more about forward looking. So pipeline, sales pipeline kind of data, retention data, collection data, um, and understanding what's coming and how we predict the future versus what's happened in the past. Yeah, yeah okay, so. I want to chime in there. I mean, that's that's a very Please, similar yeah. story to kind of what we saw in the, the financial services industry coming out of the Great Recession, right, just under a decade ago, which is where I spent um, a lot of time between about 2010 and 2016 was helping banks figure out, you know, what do we do with Dodd-Frank? Um, how do we how do we get out of this thing? And there was such a renewed focus, not just on the liquidity itself, but on the ability to understand that liquidity. Um, right. And so there, you know, renewed focus on measures like value at risk, which had been, you know, sort of part of the course in the banking industry, you know, for 80 years. But now we're talking conditional value at risk or stressed value at risk, right? What happens if um, unemployment skyrockets and in the same, you know, the same time the dollar collapses, right? Can you show us that you will still be solvent, right? The regulators are coming in and asking that question. Um, and so in order to be able to answer that question, you have to have data and you have to be able to say, hey, I, I can I can answer that question yes or no, and I can do it with some confidence. And so that that created this whole focus around things like data governance, which data, which Dan and Natalie were just talking about, right? right? Um, where we need to understand the lineage of every single data element, right? That that's that that's out there, and we need to um, rationalize our reports and make sure we don't have things that disagree with one another. Because if we do, then you know we're 
we're not going to be able to, to, to say, yes, we know that we can survive the next big event, um, right, because we're going to have the cash on hand to do that. And Brian, I think you hit on a great point, and that's what I would call kind of sensitivity analysis, which is the ability to look at these different metrics and quickly run through different scenarios of, okay, what if, you know, as I said, kind of bookings is down 20% for six months and then 50% for another year, and, it, it, and but retention is 90% now, but it's 85% in six months, but 105%, and run through all these scenarios very, very quickly and still be able to say, okay, we're going to have enough cash on hand to be able to continue to run our business and meet bank covenants. That's hard for companies to do um, for a lot of companies, but that's what we need right now. Yeah. So, and I was thinking the same thing, um, Beasley on kind of that tie-in of the governance, right? Because if, if everyone had the governance in place around the KPIs and metrics and the data was there, then obviously this is a, a somewhat simpler effort, but, but it's it's not in, in, in most organizations, right? It, it wasn't quite there. So, John, what? Uh, assuming you, you're you're kind of keyed into this based on on our discussion, whether it was what are the challenges you had of of being able to to um, collect that information and metrics and KPIs, or how or maybe the other side of that coin, how did you decide? There's 30 uh, questions need answering right now. I can only tackle three, four, or five. Um, KPIs at a time because of what I need to do to get the data. How, how did you kind of go about picking what you were going to do and focus on that, bringing that that information together, and and just kind of getting the acceleration of of that um, you know financial performance information to your stakeholders? Yeah, I mean it. Um, it really required us uh, to work with the managers at the the different operational uh, silos and work together to identify the critical KPIs. Um, I think a lot of us who are data informed and, and like, uh, you know, playing with playing with the data, um, of which I'm, you know, very, very guilty. I, I uh, you know, like uh, uh, playing around with it as much as I can and, and, you know, trying to find interesting insights. But um, at a time when you have to make decisions within not even you know days but hours uh timing becomes critical and it's not a luxury that you have in the midst of of the crisis so uh, it you know really forced us to okay what are the top two maybe three metrics uh and going back to the sensitivity analysis here we're talking about that's something that we certainly um, you know, pulled together uh, while we were, uh, you know, kind of in the midst of managing this was for uh, the hotel, for the retail, um, spread across multiple states, for food and beverage, for oil and gas, certainly, um, you know, put together these, these half dozen different uh, scenarios and then uh, combine them all at the you know, family office level and understanding what that does to our total liquidity, our total balance sheet. Um, and uh, you can't do that and try and do a full, you know, blown out model, right? Uh, like you normally might do in normal times. So um, really agreeing with your operators and agreeing with um, your board or your principal, whoever it might be on, uh, these are the critical things we need to focus on uh, and then spend your time there, uh, spend your time on those to get the greatest return. Yeah, that, that resonates with a lot of the feedback we've been getting, it, it, you know, it may seem so, common sense but whether whether in our audience you're the person making the ask for particular uh, metrics kpis or person responsible for getting it on both sides we all want a lot of answers to questions right now we've got to prioritize pick a couple focus on those because um you know unfortunately most organizations just you know aren't and, and weren't where they need to be and having that in a push button uh, fashion if you will what about um just kind of flipping same topic really, but to the other side, revenue. Um, obviously there's a lot of things organizations have to do to pivot and, and, and try to create revenue, marketing, sales, whatever the case may be, but what uh, you can only control so much. Um, what, what KPIs or metrics or particular things are people picking that they can control to focus on to at least have the information 
day to day to just start stepping through the process of making the decisions they need to be, uh, they need to, um, to start creating revenue again. Um, Jason, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Yeah, I mean, and, and we're thinking about it, you know, in the context of, and we think we've kind of stabilized where we are uh, across our portfolio for the most part. There are one or two outliers. Now we're thinking about, okay, how do we go back to investing in growth, which is kind of what we're all about is, is, as growth investors. And so for us, it gets to, to your point, right? We've got to start to see more revenue or leading indicators of more revenue coming in to be able to feel free to release that cash to go back to the levels of investment that we had before. So what we're looking for are leading indicators of future sales. And again, we're in the software world, so we call that booking. But it's, it's really kind of the very traditional kind of pipeline metrics that you would want to see um, in terms of engagement with prospects and your existing customers. So, you know, are they responding to, you know, some outreach? Are they participating in an event like this? Or is there some kind of inquiry that they're doing? Are they visiting the website? And making that progression from, you know, kind of, originating inquiry or, or lead to marketing qualified lead to sales qualified lead to opportunity to, you know, close deal. And what is the conversion rate in each of those? And are they improving? And what's the cycle time in each of those? And is that improving? And when we can start to see those things getting better, then we can release a little more. We can do a little more marketing. We can add some more salespeople. Um, but we also want to do it, you know, I would say very carefully and look at it by product or product family and by customer segment. So we know is everything growing equally or are there different segments of our businesses that are growing? And let's make sure we only unleash the cash to invest in the ones where the market is saying they're willing to, you know, start buying again or buy more than they have been over the past few months. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that resonates, and, and and John, I wonder you probably have a unique perspective there. I mean, have you guys been more focused on looking at your uh, retail divisions and 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 monitoring the information of of where you do expect or it's already happening, the revenue coming, or maybe kind of before that and making decisions about um, where where are we going to decide to try to go after getting the revenue back, given um, kind of the magnitude of the situation. Yeah, I mean, we've given the the divisions that we're in. Um, we have been forced and ended up leaning into kind of a, an unforeseen zero-based budgeting process. So um, the hotel that we own here in Dallas, uh, was, we closed uh, because we had no occupancy. Um, obviously, by government mandate, Food and beverage uh, outlets were closed uh, and uh, only open for carryout. Uh, so we had, you know, we had to model out that carryout business. Uh, retail, most of our retail operations were closed by by a government mandate. So you're now sitting in this situation after you've kind of made sure that you have sufficient liquidity uh, to maintain those operations until you can see what the exit ramp looks like. Uh, you are now in this planning process of this gives you a, a very good reason to uh, to be very um, stringent about you know where to invest uh, that capital and and like Jason said making sure that you're seeing uh, that momentum right so it really kind of gives you a, a blank slate uh, to say well we're totally shut down. Across all of our operations, uh, including oil and gas, we shut in, I think, 99% of our production because of pricing. Um, you know, where do we invest the capital uh, for well completion or uh, investing in new inventory, seasonal merchandise for retail, or um, in uh, you know reopening the hotel with uh, with new new procedures? Uh, it, leaning into that has kind of been very freeing, really. Um, and uh, it's been been kind of liberating for us to engage in that process and say, let's be uh, you know, let's be pretty stringent uh, about this and uh, make sure we have a clear exit ramp for these operations and, and only invest in those particular areas. Yeah, I, I have to say, you know, Chris Danger was talking earlier about in some organizations, 
this created that that great acceleration. I, I think that's happened broadly in a lot of ways, but more in, in pockets of certain organizations. But more often than not, the common theme I heard was kind of similar to what you're saying, right? Which was just now we had this time and opportunity, whether we like it or not, to make some decisions that we needed to do. And a lot of the analysis was there, right? By like, like making some of those hard calls. Um, so we're, we only have a, a minute or two left. Um, Brian, I don't know if you want to weigh in on kind of this topic or kind of any parting comments. And then I'll ask uh, um, uh, Jason, John as well, just, you know, kind of, you know, lightning round, any advice they'd give to the audience from any perspective. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I think it comes, comes back down to sort of that, that ability to adapt with, with massive quantities of information. You know, I think the way that um, most decisions are, are typically made is, you know, we, we make the assumption that history will repeat itself. And right now it seems like that assumption is in some level sort of out the window. And so you're kind of seeing um, you know, the emergence of, okay, we need to, we need to look at uh, not same period for same store last year. We need to look at, uh, you know, some other country that's two weeks ahead of us in this thing and see what the, what the recovery profile looks like there. Maybe that's what we can key off of, right? Um, the data's out there. Uh, it's, it's in a lot of very different places. And so it's, it's the ability to take that in, consume it quickly, um, pick out the important pieces, um, which is, which is um, a combination of having the right techniques at your disposal or right, machine learning type stuff, as well as the right intuition and business know-how, right? And putting those things together that I think is, is what can support uh, developing those profiles and starting to look two, three weeks out in the future, focused exclusively on those two to three metrics like John was talking about. These are the things that are gonna be important to us recognizing the growth and the recovery that we need, so. Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jason, any uh, parting uh, word of advice from any perspective? Uh, I, you know, I don't know words of advice. I mean, I just think, um, you know, we're really focused on, you know, what, like I talked about the leading indicators and trying to read the tea leaves. And to Brian's point, we're looking for data anywhere and everywhere we can find it. Um, and I think, you know, to his point, you know, where, you know, people can even figure out what the right new data sources are, have add a lot of value right now, because we are, we're looking around, we're, we're looking everywhere. And we're fortunate, we've got 50 companies, as I said, in our portfolio, they uh, are all B2B software companies, but they're in different, they serve different verticals, they're in different regions around the world. And we're trying to look across all of them to figure out what can we learn from this one in this industry and in this geography. Uh, and it's hard to do right now. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty and, and I think it's going to stay that way for a while, unfortunately. True. And, and yes, agreed. Unfortunately, John, any parting comment? Avoid analysis paralysis by prioritizing your metrics with a team that's focused and it's a good way to handle it. Awesome. I avoid analysis paralysis. I think we all in our own ways, have that issue, and a lot of organizations do, whether they, uh, you know, whether they like it or not, or it's purposeful or not. So, uh, thank you all so much. We're a minute or two long, so I'll, I'll properly thank you afterwards. I hope to stick around um, for half an hour, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Mr. Dan Rodriguez and Chris Laping um, for our final segment. All right, thanks, guys. Good stuff, Mr. Laping. Long time no see. I know. I got a text from my brother today. It was a picture of his temperature gauge in the car and it said gross and it said 98 degrees and he's in Tampa. So is it really 98 degrees there today? Um, inside it's cool and calm and with a nice view of the water, <laughs> but yes, it is. We have full blown hit summer here. So it is, it is uh, not pleasant as you used to remember, I'm sure from years ago, but all right. Well, for the audience, uh, I, I started joking. Um, we had this first part of the forum on Tuesday and Chris and I had a conversation then. So this is my second opportunity to speak to Chris, which I'm excited about. Um, and I'll start the same way just for uh, context to the audience. So Chief Innovation Officer of Bagel Brands and a best-selling author of People Before Things. Let's start with Bagel Brands and, and tell us a little bit about what Chief Innovation Officer means. Well, um, it's a fancy title. And uh, ultimately, the, the easiest way for me to describe it is that um, the focus is experience of the future. 
uh, we're, we wanted to think about our business uh, five, 10 years from now, what would it look like? And what would the consumer want out of a bakery? Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to be able to put a specific focus around that. A lot of that is digital experience, uh, which is sort of a no duh. I think for everybody that's watching today, we more and more have mobile apps uh, on our phones. Um, but some of it is also not technology related at all. It's simple tweaks that we can make in the guest experience that again, just sort of goes where the trends are going and ensures that we keep uh, a forward look uh, at this business, which I think clearly during a time like right now is uh, very important. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, when I when I hear innovation, uh, I hear transformation and, and I hear this this great forward looking approach and that means change. Um, and, and today we wanted to talk a little bit about change. Um, and when I think of change and I think of leadership, obviously it it's a nice segue into the second half of your introduction, which is um, your book, People Before Things. So maybe give a little bit, since it's so specific to this topic, about the theme of that book. Well, I wrote the book uh, at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. I, I quit a cushy day job that I had at the time uh, as the chief information officer at Red Robin. We were um, experiencing enormous growth and transformation, uh, almost at a 10x level in terms of our stock price. And it seemed like a good time to um, take a break, uh, and to share some of the experiences uh, with other leaders in the industry. Uh, the idea that I had was, well, you know, Red Robin is a burgers and shakes business and people get burgers and shakes. And so it's not gonna be a real complicated read. Um, I wanted to write a book about change and what the role is that leaders play in change, but I wanted it to be written from someone who had been in an executive leadership role. Because a lot of the books I read are from people who study executive leaders and have a lot of great advice, but haven't always walked a, a mile in the shoes of an executive leader. So in some ways I wanted to pick a fight with leaders and this included picking a fight with myself about like what do people in organizations need from their leaders when there is a lot of change going on? that all of the statistics say that people are suffering through change, that Gallup has reported that 70% of all change fails. And at the same time, Gallup also reports that almost 70% of the US workforce is disengaged. And I thought there's gotta be some relationship to that. Uh, I know that some people think that uh, change isn't working because people are disengaged at work, and what I was wondering is, well, what if it was that we were driving change so poorly that that's actually creating the disengagement? And I just wanted to explore that topic as a practitioner, as somebody who had been um, living this journey of change and transformation in the executive seat. I didn't really have a lot of expectations for the book, uh, but it ended up doing quite well. And so I ended up having the opportunity for three years to just go out and support the book through consulting and doing speaking engagements. And the opportunity I got there was to meet thousands and thousands of leaders across the country and to listen to their personal journeys and stories around change and transformation. Um, and it just was a, a wonderful uh, time in my life that I'm very grateful for. Yeah, it's such an incredible uh, preparation for, um, you know, for the different things that we're going through. and and. You know, traditionally, we talk about change and what we do because obviously, uh, earlier on in the forum, we talked about um, governance and data literacy and how it creates this new language. And obviously, that creates the need for change. And we use buzzwords like change agents and these fun things. But most people, when we think, when we talk about that and we say change management, they think, okay, we need some training, and we need lots of communication, and we're gonna just put that out there and then the rest will work. But I think you have a, a better and deeper understanding of that. So maybe talk about, about the difference between just communicating and training and what real change looks like from a leadership standpoint. 
It's funny because my understanding of change management uh, at one point was just around training and communications as well. And I remember I was driving this big change initiative at Red Robin and we had this outside company helping us, these change experts help us. And what they had to do is they had to go into the support center and they had to uh, interview people from all of the various functions that were gonna come together for this big change initiative. And um, the goal of those conversations with all of those cross-functional areas was to just find out who is going to ultimately block this change, who is going to get in the way of the change, and, and why were they not going to get on board. And I remember the consultants came into my office, and I sat down, and I was like really attentive, and I just pulled myself up to the table, and I'm like, I want to know right now who is going to be my biggest blocker for change. <laughs> And the consultant said, well, I mean, uh, Chris, this is kind of interesting and we're sort of sorry to have to deliver you this message, but IT is the organization that's least ready for change. And it was a punch in the gut that needed to happen because it caused me to just really stare in the mirror and reflect on what my role was as a leader. And what I realized in this project, and I think that I had been picking up along the way in my career, is that change are these other things that basically uh, make it easy or really hard to be successful. And that communications and, and training um, are on the very, very back end of change and are actually just a reflection of everything that's going on in the organization. So if the organization has a lot of dysfunction and isn't set up for change, well then the training and the communication seem very dysfunctional. And I think we've all been on the receiving end of like a, a memo from a CEO and we're like, where did this come from? Or we go into a training session with someone we've never even met before and they're telling us that there's some mandatory process or technology we need to start using. That's gonna make so, your life better, right? It's, that's you're right. Gonna do it, it's gonna make your life better. It's gonna be so awesome. So anyway, um, I started to deep dive at that time. Uh, well, what are the reasons why people resist change? And it turns out that the reasons people resist and push back change really have less to do uh, with training and communications. And they had more to do with these like very practical things that as a leader, it was my job to do something about. So if I give you one example, one of the conclusions I reach in the book, one of the seven reasons why people push back on change is because they don't have the time of day to absorb change. They, they have no capacity to do something new. They have a day job. That day job takes them 40 to 50, hour, uh, 50 hours a week to do the work. And someone comes along and says, hey, I want you to learn this new system. And it's going to take you about 10 hours a week for about five or six weeks to uh, get good at this system. Where's the, where are they going to get that time? And so it's not that people are resisting change. It's not that people are lazy. It's that people are tired. And um, it's not that people don't care. Like I used to think as an executive, they're like, well, if people are as committed as I am about the brand, they'll come in and do the extra work. <laughs> And this has nothing to do with commitment, right? We, we all have relationships we're trying to nurture. In some cases, we have sick and dying parents. We have all of these things going on in our lives. We're giving discretionary effort is not a choice. So my job as a leader is to clear the decks, to get really clear on what's important and what should the priorities be. And the stuff that's not that important should be pushed aside. And if this new change initiative is really important, then, and it's going to take people 10 hours a week to learn, then my job as a leader is to say, hey, you spend about 15 hours a week doing X, and I'm going to go ahead and take that responsibility away for the next few weeks while you're learning this new system. I don't even want you to worry about that. That's the role of a leader. If I throw training and communications on top of an already busy work schedule, who is going to show up to the training and who's even going to read the memo? I mean, I don't, you, you know this, Dan, I don't even read email. So if I'm not reading email, why do I expect other people are going to read email? 
So the book really explores this. It came from this journey uh, as a leader where I was really trying to understand what do I need to do to make sure my people are really successful? And what is my role in that? Uh, I did not want to be the executive who showed up on the kickoff meeting. It was the only time you'd ever see me. And I would be like, failure is not an option. And then leave the room and then come back 15 weeks later. And it turns out failure is an option. And we had failed miserably. And I had abandoned the team. Uh, or the other example is, and I know if you, for the people that are, are dialed in right now who are IT people, they'll understand this. The very people who ask you to do this work are like nowhere to be found when you're doing the work. Right. Um, so they have a role to play in this. I have a role to play in this. And the, you know, the, the byline of the title, People Before Things, is change isn't an end user problem. People are not resisting change. People just like the time thing have not had the right conditions put in place for them to be successful. That's so fascinating, the the insight, because I have been in both chairs um, and I have been, unfortunately, I laughed a little too uh, wholeheartedly when, you know, you have this, well, they if they're committed, if they're bought in, then, you know, they're all going to be on board. Um, and what I loved about the People Before Things book and the, and the concept is it starts with kind of grabbing the mirror, right? And, and looking in the mirror first mm -hmm. and figuring out what's my role um, in this problem versus how do I fix other people and fix other parts of this organization. Yes. So I love that piece. And it, I've been kind of uh, tongue in cheek today around most of the topics we've been talking about are sitting on top of an already complex um situation and now we've added crisis yeah so for sure change leadership is difficult period and, and it is something that's hard in leadership um in general but what are your thoughts now as you've been a leader in this uh and someone quipped on tuesday that we're all change agents but we actually hate change ourselves <laughs> um or mm -hmm. that we we're resistant to change ourselves. And so of course. as you've lived through this and as someone who's kind of an expert in, in the space, what is it like in crisis? How is it different now? Well, first of all, what I'll say is, you know, there is a difference between a controlled change initiative where a team of people have been working on something perhaps for six months that an organization has gone through the process of investing in it and budgeting for it. And at some level, there's been some conversation for months leading up to it. Even then, it's hard. And what's different now is this is a different kind of change. This is the uncontrolled crisis that hits us out of left field. And um, we have to read and react. And what I think is really interesting right now as I study this and see this going on, I think startups and smaller companies are naturally positioned in a crisis to be able to respond to it more um, because there's a little bit more responsiveness already built into their business. When you're building a new business, it's not so contrived. You're not building a business plan that lasts for 18 months. You're thinking about it in terms of three to six months at a time. And in crisis, we need to be in that one to three months. But here's the thing, I think, ultimately, that all of this um, uh, requires from us as leaders. I do think that the controlled change initiative and the short-term crisis uh, do have something in common. And what that is, is that what people really need is they really need leaders to show them two things, love and clarity. And they need that in crisis and they need that in a big change initiative. That when people come to work, they just want those two simple things from their leaders. They want to know that that leader cares about them. And so when I say love, it isn't, you know, put your arms around them and hug them in an HR inappropriate way. I'm talking about simple things that demonstrate we care. And then people want clarity. And I want to just sort of point out that clarity is not the same as transparency. Transparency is vomiting a bunch of information on people and hoping that they make sense of those parts and pieces. Clarity is when you help people find their story in your story. 
that they can see that there's a future for them, that there's safety and security in this future, and that they play an important role when they show up to work. And it's funny because all of the workplace happiness studies, they, they conclude different things uh, about what people want at work. Uh, but what's interesting is that all of those different studies, they do link back to a common thread, which is when we get out of bed in the morning and we put our two feet on the ground, the one thing that we want is we want to feel like we're making a difference. And so love and clarity is so required, uh, it's such a requirement for leaders to provide that so that people feel like they're making a difference. And I think, again, that is required, whether it's a big change initiative that you've been planning for, which is amazing, right? Because the Gallup data in that 70%, it, it's in that category. It's the stuff you've been actually thinking about and you budgeted for and you've been working on. And mm -hmm. even when you knew it was gonna happen, it still didn't happen well. So you can only imagine what happens uh, in crisis. And so I just think if if I were, giving uh, uh, a talk to a room full of leaders, and I know there's a lot of leaders on this webinar, I would just say it just comes back to love and clarity. And how do you do that in crisis? Um, some people will see the crisis as an opportunity. I think it's possible that there's a crisis in, in, and there's an opportunity that those two things can actually coexist in the same sentence. But I also recognize there's some businesses out there like hospitality, uh, when you think about hotels or you think about restaurants or you think about even people massage therapy, I think about movie theaters, there's no opportunity in this. There, there's no opportunity. So it's crisis, it's pure crisis. And so how do you provide people in those scenarios with that love and clarity? And again, it's just, to me, it's as simple as that. And if we don't as leaders have time for love and clarity and we don't provide that in crisis or in plan change initiatives, uh, if we can't do that, then I think it's a tall order for us to expect that our teams are gonna just magically put it together. I completely agree. And I think honestly, um, the most powerful lessons as a leader are the ones that are, that are the most simple. Uh, and, I, and I greatly appreciate how simple love and clarity are and we know that time is the only resource we can't change. We can't buy more of and we can't get more of. And so the biggest travesty that we talk about as a leadership team is if our people are spending time making a difference in the wrong areas. And if they're spending their energy improving things that are that are lower down the totem pole or that aren't really um, moving the needle for us as a, as a brand or as a company. And so I, I love the, I love the love. Um, I love the the empathy side of love. I think that's it's so powerful, especially today. And you know, I, I hear people. I had someone quip with me on LinkedIn about crisis is an opportunity, and it, it's tough. Um, I think from a business standpoint or from a financial standpoint, that's a tough that's a tough bridge to cross. From a human connection standpoint, I, I get the merit there. Um, there's an opportunity to to love the person that you work with. Um, and to create a, a human connection that it's okay to be scared during these times. It's okay not to, to feel confident in what's gonna happen to us, but life will go on. And um, that's hard to see uh, at times. So I get that side of it, but, but I think what you said is, is really spot on and fascinating with, with just those two things, you can really move the needle as a leader. Well, and here's the reason why I use the word love too, and I just would clarify this with everyone. Um, uh, my my 18 year old son uh, just graduated from high school and he had a really huge theater career in high school. And I was always so curious uh, about uh, Caleb and what he was learning in theater and how I could apply that to life. And one day he was telling me that, you know, when they are uh, rehearsing or getting themselves ready for any show, they are always trying to amp their emotion 10x what it is that they're trying to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Because when you're sitting in an audience, it can get lost. It can get lost in all these things that distract you. So they have to be 10 times more expressive 
than what the character and the emotion is actually asking for. And um, which I think is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I use the word love. Because as a leader, if I can 10X what people need from me, people don't truly need like love, love that they would get from their significant others or from their family. But if I can at least in my head frame it as this 10X thing, like, hey, when I show up, I have got to be expressive of love, then there might be half a chance that I'll actually execute that. Um, and so again, uh, I just think that people wanna know that we care about them in crisis. I think about like, how do they know that? Well, they know that when you communicate with them constantly mm -hmm. and that when you communicate with them, you communicate with them authentically. Um, so I try, I know when, with my team, we uh, get together, uh, we were getting together uh, daily, then we changed it to twice a week, now once a week. And when I get on there, I'm not trying to like screen or mask my own emotions in the moment. Um, I want them to know that just like them, I'm suffering uh, at home. And I know, Dan, you and I have talked about this. We're both extroverts. So we are, you know, when you feel like your only option is to sit in four walls in front of a desk uh, between you and a computer, it, it, it can really um, do crazy things to your head. So yeah. I want them to know that. And that's the, the most sincere way I know in terms of expressing love to them is that um, I care about them enough that I want them to know that I too am, am feeling the struggles that they're feeling. Yeah, absolutely. The basis of courage is vulnerability. And I, and I think that um, sharing that does does show that. And, and you know, the 10X um, concept applies to clarity too, right? Like we always say as leaders, like you have to say it 10 times for them to even remember right. it you feel like you've said it a hundred times because you've talked about it behind closed doors to all kind of other people. But when you get in front of your teams, you say it once and you expect them, well, I told them once, how could they be confused about this concept? Um, and yeah, I think the 10 X, I love the expressive analogy um, for theater because it applies to everything. It applies to empathy and love. It, it applies to the clarity piece just as much. So that's, that's a nugget I'll definitely take with me. Um, there's so many, people in this audience that, and I hope that this reaches with this message who might be saying, I get that. Like, I, I think I can do that, but I'm sitting in a boardroom or I'm sitting executive team with people who don't see that. So when we talk about leadership and their, their understanding of change, you've obviously studied it. You've had an epiphany. How do you go viral within your executive team to get them to see that and to not have some of the the things that we were kind of jokingly speaking of those those misperceptions around how to drive change well i think you i think it's a great question and it, it's one of the more popular questions i heard for three years i and it, sometimes they get framed differently in an audience someone in the audience would say like i totally get this i believe this but my executive that i work for is a jerk <laughs> and he'll never get it and I used to always say to those people in the audience, well, then you need to quit. I mean, listen, if you if you believe that you have a value disconnect with your boss and you're never going to line up, then then this is on you. You got to move on. But if I to be serious for a minute, I do think it is about action results and then talk. So I think like, as an example, if these ideas resonate, the worst thing you could do, I think, is go talk to an executive team and then try to, through words, convince them that this is the way they should think about it. So I think the best thing to do is to take these things you believe in, you put them in action, and then you get undeniable results. I'm not talking about results that are just a little bit better you should be seeing massive productivity improvements when you implement this. All the studies say for a fact that you'll get 30 to 50% productivity improvement from it. That's massive. So put it in action, get those massive results. And then, and only then, when someone says, how did you get those results? That's when you say, oh, well, let me tell you, let me tell you what I did. And then you trumpet the merits of 
engaging people and bringing them with you and pacing change with people and, and all that good stuff. Um, I just know too many times in my career, I have been the um, self-righteous one where I show up and I say to a group of people, this is what we should do. If we were good people, this is what we would do. And it just falls on deaf ears because I think a lot of times people think that this touchy feely stuff uh, is different than concrete results. And, uh, and that's not the case at all. I mean, I think about all the audience that I talk to and I would say, hey, um, think about your uh, successes in your career, your, the winning teams you've been on. Every time you've ever won, like what did those teams all have in common? I swear to God, Dan, 100% of the time, people in the audience would say, those teams had communications, respect, trust, collaboration. They had a unified vision. They were accountable, the results, 100% of the time. And I would say that's interesting because it, you didn't talk about cloud in your answer. You didn't say you were on winning teams because you had an awesome project plan. You didn't say you were on winning teams because you had cool Excel spreadsheets. Every one of you in the room, you just said that communications, respect and trust and collaboration are the reasons you won. So the question I ask is if that, we all know that, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we talking about it more? And inevitably the audience would say, because it's not tangible because this touchy-feely stuff, you can't measure it. But then if you follow it up with, well, what are you trying to accomplish right now in your business? Well, we're trying to grow sales. Uh, what else are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to improve profit. Uh, what else are you trying to do? We're trying to you know, do this, do that. It turns out that these things are immeasurable when it's just you and I talking about them, but they actually show up in the results. Absolutely. In the results of winning or losing. So I think our role to sort of influence executive leaders down this road is to get great results, to get a great score on the scoreboard. And now we have permission to talk about it. And by the way, if we don't get good results from doing that, then we try differently and we keep working the model until we have something that we can talk about and that we can talk about in a Twitter size update to an executive. And, th and then change can happen. And then ultimately, if you don't think you can do that and the executives don't change, then you're truly working in the wrong place. You just need to move on. You have a difference in values. You wouldn't stick in a personal relationship with someone who had a difference of values for too long. So why would you allow yourself to do that professionally? Sorry for the long Absolutely. answer. No, that's it's perfect. It was a perfect answer. Um, some powerful stuff today. Uh, I knew it was going to be a good conversation and, and change is such a... A fascinating topic. I didn't realize how powerful it was going to be. So I, I'm taking away from it uh, love and clarity. I'm taking away from it 10x. Um, and I'm definitely taking away actions and results before speaking. So uh, thanks so much, Chris, for joining uh, twice this week. Really appreciate your time. I know Thank the audience is going to appreciate it. I uh, hope you have an awesome Memorial Day weekend. We're going to kind of turn Thank into you. a happy hour here and do a little bit of Q&A. <laughs> um, I always I really love standing it. between people and drinks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but but please stick around. You guys stay on cam uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Dan, I, I jumped in. Sorry, but um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Dan uh, and, and and Chris. I'm I'm sorry we haven't actually been been able to meet in person, but I, I look forward to doing it in the future. Um, uh, you know, for those those that know me, I, I love the love commentary. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an idealist at heart, and whatever success I've had in whatever capacity. And my life has been pretty fundamentally uh, tied to just, just caring about people, right? Um, so at least from my perspective, um, really enjoyed uh, that conversation. Um, so I, I need to read your book and I might need some kind of therapy session about actually being <laughs> the person that creates all the change and maybe somehow being better about doing that um, with my peers. Um, so thanks, guys. I, a couple quick comments, and then for, for whoever's left at that point, we'll, we'll open it up. But um, for all speakers, thank you so much. Um, definitely couldn't uh, be more appreciative for, for your time and, and, and commitment to us, to our audience. Um, if you want to go get a drink real quick or have one uh, adult beverage or otherwise, please do. Um, we'll do a little, little toast um, to all of our attendees. Thank you so much. Um, be sure to 
look out for the invitation after this, email me, anybody at CCG, call me, text me, whatever. But um, we're inviting everyone to uh, schedule their rapid recovery workshop, right? We're, um, you know, bringing great people together to do great things, to do extraordinary things is our mission. And um, we, we try to do that with this forum and we believe in that deeply. So uh, we want everybody to schedule uh, a workshop with some of our experts, potentially some of our customers uh, after this to explore some of these topics and help you guys put the right things in motion um, as we all look to recover from this.